Yeah, so thanks for inviting, and uh, it's my first time that I meet, uh, no, I mean, Said is kind of engineering and earth science, but the first time that I'm in an earth science community in Coventry, so it's nice to know that you're here. Um, so I'm, again, my background is kind of earth science, engineering, uh, but now I'm at the kind of more engineering side in, in this uh, center, which is half new, I mean, it's rebranded, and we have our kind of new group, uh, which we call Engineering Applications of Fluid Mechanics. So part of the reason that I'm here is in to introduce us, uh, and I think Said is probably the only one you know from that, from, from our center, so maybe Alban. So we are studying kind of the basic science problem related to fluid dynamics, but we are focusing on different engineering applications of these systems. Okay, so we look and we use different tools, we use experiments, mostly in the lab. Uh, we do some analytical de development, some theory and uh, numerical simulations in diverse kind of problems. So again, the group, even our little group, which is like seven people is, or eight people is very, very diverse. So I do, and Said flow in porous medium. Some people do heat transfer, some people do turbulence, aerodynamics. But the idea is not just to look at these, you know, vortices or, or impinging jets, or all these classical fluid dynamic problems per se, just for the sake of, of they are very interesting. And we have many other people in the center that, that are applied mathematicians or statistical physicists that do that. And they do it very well. But we really want to look at this problem in a specific context, or specific contexts, of how, to, how they affect different systems that we are interested in. So again, in my perspective, it's soil remediation, carbon sequestration, uh, so the more geo side. But also we have, you know, just yesterday we had a talk about the, the effect of ice forming on the blades of wind turbines in cold climates on the performance of the, and the, and the integrity, cooling of engine parts, so again looking at very no basic heat transfer problems, but for a very specific application in mind sometimes, or specific type of applications, biomechanics, so very diverse, but again, it's a basic science that is harnessed to solve problems that we are practical problems. And again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna talk about kind of non-equilibrium flow and introduce what is non-equilibrium because it's like a scary physics word, but I think it's really, a good title for, for a lot of what I do. So I think half of the presentation will be just introducing what is non-equilibrium and different examples and, and why should we care? And I can al also already give that at the onset, so you don't have to wait. So the main message here is that flow in the subsurface is, or hydro, hydrology, hydrogeology is very complicated, made very complex because of different pore scale mechanisms that lead to what I will just ex explain now as non-equilibrium, so hysteresis, rate dependency, preferential pathways. I think most of the talk will be some examples of preferential pathways. And even though it's poor scale mechanisms, these things really affect the scale that we care about of kilometers or geological scales, or hundreds of meters. So this is, again, the essence of the talk, and I will spend probably half of the time just introducing and, and giving some examples in brief, and then as time permits, probably less than 50 minutes, uh, I will go into some more depth of a few particular examples. But as many, many, I mean, again, I'll be happy to talk afterwards with people who are interested. And I think we are very lucky in, as people that do modeling in, in I think in general geosciences, but specifically in, in my field of, you know, subsurface flow or hydrogeology, because it's really, really a challenging problem that I would say much more challenging than many other problems in physics or, or even in earth sciences. And for several reasons. One is this huge heterogeneity that we have, which is really inherent. I mean, if you go and sample the soil outside there and the grass in one location and then half a meter to the side, the properties, the mineralogy, the, the everything can be very, very different. Even within one, I don't know, cubic meter of soil, you can have 10 orders magnitude difference in uh, uh, changes in permeability, for example. You can have different minerals that mean different wettability. 
So one part of the sa very same sample will, will be hydrophilic, another part will be hydrophobic. So the distribution of the different phases, so we can have you know, fluids uh, of gases, liquids, the different solids. So all that is really inherent. This is in every piece of you know, sediment or soil or, or at the subsurface. Then these properties keeps evolving because of different processes that are coupled. For example, dissolution, precipitation, uh, I'll give a, a few examples. Uh, mechanical deformation like fracturing. And this, this is where this non-equilibrium comes in. So it's a very highly non-linear problem. This will be most of the part of this talk. And this all happens across this Processes are coupled ac across different scales. So many of these processes are at the pore scale. And, and this is coupled, again, not just at in terms of the length scale, but also in terms of the time scales, which kind of goes together very often. So some of these processes, for example, of fluid uh, film flows that, you know, you have fluid displacement and you have a front of, I don't know, a contaminant or you're pushing... Uh, brine with CO2 and you're looking at the main bulk front but then at the sub kind of millimeter or, or sub second scale you have these trail uh, leading films that really change the wettability ahead and they really affect the type of patterns that you'll get and this can affect you know problems of like water infiltrating into the soil through fingers so these gravity fingers at the meter scale or minutes and this will eventually affect Again, the kilometer scale at geological times, or maybe not geological, but like the time scale of years that we care about in projects like carbon sequestration or enhanced recovery. So the outcome is a huge parameter space, really like tens of, at, at every problem that I can think of or that I work with, there was tens of parameters that are coupled. And each of those can vary, or not each, but some of those can vary by 10 orders of magnitude in one particular problem. So it's really, I think, way beyond some other problems, in, again, in physics or in, in fluid dynamics. So non-equilibrium. So, and again, I'm, I gave a similar talk in, in Warwick, in the fluids uh, group there, with a hardcore fluid dynamicists, you know, physicists, applied mathematicians, also the most of the people in our center. So, so many people are like surprised. So are you doing turbulence? What kind of Reynolds numbers? What? No, 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 this is very slow flows. It, there's, there's no turbulence. It's all like, in terms of fluid dynamics, it's as simple as it can. It, it's what you learn in, in the first class, in the, the first year, in, in your first degree. The complexity comes from other parts. One of them is the geometry. So this is a typical carbonate. So the flow geometry is really complex. But then the phenomena, or the, the processes, capillarity, then you can have you know, chemis geochemistry, geomechanics. But, but yeah, if, if we would have a simple geometry, if like a pipe, no, no heterogeneity, you, you wouldn't have this, but you have some kind of a pipe and a single inert fluid flowing in there, then the problem would be really simple. And it sounds ridiculous, but I emphasize that many of the models that we're using today you know, in, in earth sciences and different constitutive laws like capillary pressure, saturation, or relative permeability are really based on these kind of assumptions. And the most notable maybe is this capillary bundle model. You know, when you take this complexity and you say, oh, this is 10% uh, of these fine pores, 50% of that coarser pores, and I will translate that into a different volume of capillary tubes that are not, connect, uh, not interacting together. And this will give me you know, the pressure saturation, or I can now do an experiment of retention of, of how much water goes in and out when I change the pressure and back out the pore size distribution. So really, this is really what we're using in reservoir simulators. So this is state of the art uh, in many cases, or Richard's equation that is really still underlying reservoir simulators. So obviously the problem is that things are not simple in most cases. And you have more than one phase. So, and even if you have one phase, typically it will interact with the medium. Like you have any brine or any, uh, any water infiltrating into the soil will have some CO2. So you can start dissolving carbonates or precipitating some other solids, changing the geometry. Typically you will have at least two phases or three phases. Then you have capillary forces that can change the, 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 you know, the, the fluid distribution 
mechanical deformation, so many, many out of equilibrium. So what, what kind of phenomena am I relating to in, in out of equilibrium? So one is rate dependency. So this is looking at from below, but, but like at a quasi 2D, this is like a, a, a thin layer of glass beads so I can visualize through. And I'm injecting at the center air to displace water, and these patterns are the air you don't see here, neither, neither the water or the beads. And when I inject slowly, because of the heterogeneity again inherent, even though it, these are very perfectly engineered glass beads at one specific size, just the packing disorder that the brings heterogeneity, which causes different apertures, different pore sizes that leads to these intermittent jumps at different locations, a lot of trapping of the defending fluids, so very rich phenomena just for this, this very simple medium that is much simpler than any sediment or any sand you can imagine. So this is when I inject very slowly, when I inject fast at the same medium, now I suddenly get this viscous fingering, so again, very different types of, and this not just depends, this is not just rate dependent, this links to preferential pathways. So you get some other types of fingering or preferential pathways here, just by virtue of changing the flow rate. So this is one very well-known example, but that we are still struggling with. Another one is different kind of instabilities. So this could be this hydrodynamic instabilities, like what happens in this uh, fingering. But you can have other phenomena that are usually uh, take place. For example, this is a mechanical deformation, what I called uh, capillary fracturing. So because of capillary forces, this is looking again to the same glass beads, but for very close by with a, with a, with a microscope, or as a, a macro lens. So this is, the, this is the air trying to push the water. These are the beads. And I increase the, the pressure. I try to force you know, the meniscus, essentially overcome the capillary entry pressure, which depends on the aperture. So this is, again, simple physics, young Laplace law. So I, I want to invade by capillarity. But then what happens in this case, because these are, this is a sediment and, un, and a confined sediment, so the particle can move. So what happens is that at some stage, the capillary pressure, the, the pressure jump between the air and the water at the interface can push kind of the particles and create its own professional pathway. And this is how it looks at the cell. This is this kind of 20 centimeter cell with the glass beads from the top. So you see that you get this very focused finger that is growing, self-propagating by opening its way, again, pushing the beads, very different, again, behavior from what we, we looked at before. The same beads, everything is the same. And this is one type of this instability, a mechanical instability. You can also have a chemical instability or wormholing. So this is the dissolution instability where you, I, this is a kind of statistically homogeneous medium. So again, this could be some piece of very, very uh, homogeneous carbonate. I inject here uh, water with some CO2. Um, let me play it again uniformly, but because there is some slight heterogeneity, the water goes slightly more into one region, but then because it's reacting with the solid, it dissolves it faster. And then this is a self-propagating or a kind of, kind of an unstable process where eventually you get one or two branches that dominate and go through the medium and you get this wormhole. So this is a poor scale mechanism, but again, this can upscale all the way to the field and cause cars formation, or in Israel it's a big concern about sinkholes in the Dead Sea, so water dissolving these uh, salt layers. And then hysteresis, which is the main topic that I'm working currently, but I leave it aside because, again, the physics is a little bit more complicated, and, and so I decided to focus on this talk, even though the, the abstract promised many, many, many types of, uh, many examples, so I will actually focus on preferential pathways. But hysteresis, as you all know, this is the capillary pressure saturation, so the retention curve, which again is the building block for every continuum model or every reservoir simulator that we use, hydros, you know, uh, anything that you're using, uh, also the, in the petroleum industry, which again, these guys are using, you know, this to, to gain information that is worth billions, but still it's based on 
capillary pressure saturation curve. And these are very hysteretic. So if you start with a saturated sample and you increase the capillary pressure, the suction, this is the drainage, the main drainage curve. Now if you decrease the capillary pressure, and this is the imbibition part, now displacing air into to displace the water into the sample, now you are going along a different route. Okay, and you can have all these complexities if you stop the cycle in the center, these partial loops. But the main thing is if you look at, at a given state, at a given capillary pressure, at a given energy at the system, you have very different saturation between imbibition and drainage. So it depends on the path, on the history of what you do. Again, a very interesting problem in physics with a lot of implications for remediation, carbon sequestration, trapping, etc. And again, as I started showing you, this is often driven by poor scale mechanism, but it has a big effect on at much larger scales. So again, this phenomena at the scales of, of few millimeters eventually leads to these chimneys. This, this is a seismic uh, section in a marine sediment. And this is a methane gas coming from some reservoir that is, this is hundreds of meters high. Again, and this means that what can you say about, for example, the average saturation? I mean, if you are averaging over this type of building block, it's really meaningless, no? Or the residence time, or the same thing with reactions, no? So again, this post scale mechanism leads to cast caves that you can stand in. Uh, so what is the average reaction rate in this REV, in this representative volume? I mean, here it's zero, here it's very high. So again, the continuum models that we are using are kind of really get very shaky when, when, we, when we are, again, encountering this poor scale mechanism. So the naive kind of approach would be, okay, so just put it all in, you know, put in your models, all the processes, and at the poor scale, this is impossible and it will remain impossible you know, with all the computing and GPUs and whatever, you know, HPC. I mean, someone estimated the number of pores in a, in a reservoir, so it's about Avogadro number, so there will be no way that we can really, so 10 to the 23, no way we can really solve pore by pore, you know, in a reservoir or in a 100 meters site. So we'll have to do something smarter. And the thing is, of course, to simplify, no? That's what we do as modelers. And you have to really simplify the problem reduce the number of processes. Uh, I'm using very often these analog mediums, which I can also uh, model experimentally very easily and develop a theory. But you have to do it smart because you don't want to essentially throw the baby you know, with the bathwater. You want to keep the essential mechanisms in place. You know? So if you can avoid, I don't know, geochemistry, use inert materials. If biology doesn't matter, make sure that you don't have microbes growing there. But when they are, you can just ignore it. Pretty obvious. So, and I'm combining different tools. So experiments give you the ground truth, and I put it in quotation mark because this is experiments very often with very simplified materials. For example, micro models are very powerful. I use those a lot, either microfluidics or 3D printing, because you can really design your own microstructure and of course visualize or Healy show cells. And this is very powerful. And also for deformable medium, I showed you this glass beads example uh, experiment. So this can allow you to really control confinement and look at geomechanics, not just to look at the different effect of microstructure or, or, or surface properties. And this is very strong because now you can compare it simulations. So I'm using a lot of numerical simulations, which of course are very powerful because it provides you with much more rich information. You can know the distribution of the forces. You can do things that you cannot do experimentally explore parameter space, do some statistics that is needed for theory. And again, these very simplified model systems allows you to do a one-to-one, -one, you know, this is experiments, in, this is drying of a microfluidic, the air invades here and dries this cell, and this is simulations with poor networks. You can do really one-to-one -one with the same geometry, and this is very important because sometimes the microstructure has everything. So there's so much uncertainty. Again, you go outside, you do, you take two samples. The answers that you get for, I don't know, breakthrough time from one and for the other can be an order of magnitude. So what do you do? Do you just average? So here you can really 
uh, pinpoint the effect of the microstructure. And I also do a, a theory, so a lot of, I show a few examples of scaling analysis, again, extending to different scales, to different settings. And this is made possible with the simplest systems, because if you look at the real geometry of this carbonate that I showed, it's very hard to do any theory accounting for, you know, capillarity or things that you need to do, know the geometry of the interfaces and so forth. And of course, then you go, you have to go back and look at the problem that you're trying to solve, the real, you know, air science or engineering problem and see, did you throw the baby or, 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 or keep it in the real much more complex system, uh, settings. Okay, so I think I'll leave the next, uh, let's see. Um, okay, so I think the next like 20 minutes or so I'll devote to a few examples, mostly in the area of preferential pathways due to instabilities in fluid-fluid displacement. So you have one fluid like a gas displacing uh, a brine like this problem, and I want to look at these preferential pathways, why they're forming different reasons and how do we model them. So why should you care in the very beginning? Again, this happens very often. I would say that this is more the norm than the exception. So usually, you know, you pour some water or, or I don't know, you want to make coffee and, you know, things doesn't percolate very evenly and this is with very you know, uniform system, if you, if you have some uh, oil spill, it will never go like in a nice layer or you want to extract it. It's always some fingering, some preferential pathways at different scales. And it's very important because it's allowed very rapid transport. Uh, if you think of the rate that methane gets here to the, this is the, the ocean water above the sediments. So this can be orders of magnitude faster which means that, for example, you would think, oh, I will have some oxidation and I don't care because the methane will not get to the atmosphere if it's, if it's very slow, if it has to go through all this bulk of the sediment, but if it runs through this chimney or through this structure, then it might actually get to the, to the atmosphere and cause global warming. You know? So very, very rapid transport, orders of magnitude different than what you would either calculate if you think, oh, everything is uniform, I, I just have a front here, you know, you have a very preferential conduit. It really can reduce the sweep of the defending fluid, you know, or regional fluid. So here you really, the saturation or, or the, the amount of fluid that you inject, here air or here methane, is minuscule relative to the entire bulk fluid. So if you want to remove oil or remove contaminant, you, you kind of screwed in this case. And it, it can cause a lot of trapping, which can be good for carbon sequestration, but again, very bad for remediation or oil recovery. It, it increases significantly the interfacial area. You know, if you have a front relative to this sometimes almost fractal uh, kind of interface, so a lot of interfacial area which promotes mixing and reaction. So again, a lot of interesting or important consequences for this type of preferential pathways. And again, a, a big kind of thing that is obvious, but often I don't know if even if forgotten, but we just ignore it altogether when we use different models and simulators, that the continuum models very often take kind of building blocks of, of you know, it doesn't matter here, it could be tens of meters, here it can be, I don't know, a centimeter cubed, but still that can be too, 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 too large. And then you really average and get meaningless kind of parameters or answers. So these kind of preferential pathways in specif in specific, specifically can really undermine the, I would say, the validity of your continuum models that we are using today. So one very kind of rich area of, of research for me and for a lot of the community in porous medium is wettability effects okay, and how that affects the stability and preferential pathways. So wettability, uh, I refer to the relative affinity of the solid to the two fluids. So this is again a fluid-fluid displacement. So you have gas and water, for example, or, or CO2 and, and, and brine, uh, or water and oil, if you want to displace oil. And it's usually measured by the contact angle. And we say that, for example, the soil is hydrophilic if it likes the, mo the water more than the air. So you put water and it absorbs very nicely and it's hydrophobic if it's really rejects you know, the, the, the water and then you have this puddling. 
And again, we quantify it by the contact area, the contact that this is a, a water droplet, this is the surface of, the, of, the, of a sediment grain, for example, the, the pore. And if the angle is very small, if it's spreading very nicely, we said that it's hydro hydrophilic. Or, and if we are pushing, again, a fluid to displace this fluid, we call it drainage because we are displacing the wetting fluid with the non-wetting fluid. On the other hand, if it's very, if the substrate, okay, the chemical properties of the surface are more prone or, or, or prefer the fluid, uh, sorry, prefer the other fluid, here air, so it will try to minimize the contact area. Again, this is just thermodynamics, very simple thermodynamics. So it tries to minimize the energy, minimize the area, and that means that it will form a droplet, and then the angle will become larger than 90. That's the, the kind of again, the brute force uh, or, or the, the official, I don't know, the discrimination between hydrophobic and hydrophobic. But again, the extreme is that the, f the solid really likes the, the, the defending fluid here, the water, in most of the examples that I will show, or really prefers the gas, for example, it's really hydrophobic, and then it tries to reject the water. Okay, so high contact angle, low contact angle, I will call this non-wetting invasion or drainage when we push the, s the fluid that is wetting, and imbibition when we are injecting the fluid that is wetting to push the non-wetting fluid. So what abilities can really vary, again, in space. So again, take a sample from outside. You can have minerals that are very hydrophobic or hydrophilic. Also, it varies in time. It can also vary with rate, but I'll, I'll avoid that altogether. But it can also change in time. So if a rock is in contact with oil, it will eventually become oil wet and vice versa. So it changes chemically. And this has significant implications for the flow patterns, for retention, for flow. And one of them that is really important, for example, again, for remediation or for enhanced recovery, for water flooding of oil, is the fact, and this is a very old experiment from the 80s, showing that as you displace a more, and this is relatively rapid displacement, so you, have, you get this fingering that I showed before, this sort of viscous fingering, relatively rapid displacement of the defending fluid. Here the defending fluid is more wetting, so this is drainage. We push a non-wetting phase, non-wetting fluid to displace in a porous medium to displace the wetting phase. So we get this fingering, which is kind of unstable, and you leave a lot of, a lot of trapping, a lot of the defending fluid behind. Not very plausible for, again, for energy recovery or for re remediation. However, they show that when they change the affinity of the, again, the, the surface properties or the wettability, so now they, and this instability stems from, again, this is going kind of to porous media physics, but this goes to dis displacing a much more viscous fluid by a much less viscous fluid. So imagine, for example, air displacing water or water displacing very heavy oil. However, you still keep, the s they kept the same viscosity ratio, so it's still very unstable, so you're still pushing something very vi viscous, and you would expect this same fingering, but changing the wettability such that now the defending fluid, the original fluid, is non-wetting, so they are pushing the wetting fluid in bibition, and suddenly they get much more stable displacement, suppressing some of this fingering. And this remains a very puzzling kind of uh, observation that couldn't be reproduced, couldn't be explained theoretically or produced numerically. And the reason is that it's all about the pore scale here. So at the very fine scale of this is a microfluidic experiment, so looking at this 2D kind of pillar structure, but that's very instructive because you can really see in a microscope what are the individual events of invading a pore. Again, this very simplified system. So what you see here is when you have drainage, when you have the defending fluid, this again, this is air and water or air and, and, and oil. So the defending fluid is more wetting. You are displacing it with a non-wetting fluid, so in drainage. The contact angle is very small, so you really are kind of almost parallel here to the surface. 
And this means just by pure geometry that once the curvature is, you increase the pressure, the capillary pressure, so you increase the curvature. Once the curvature is strong enough, which means that it cannot fit geometrically here, in a sense, that really this depends only on the aperture of this pore, this constriction, you will get this jump. You get a very rapid displacement and the water will be pushed, the air interface will move here. However, when you look at imbibition, okay, so now the, this, this uh, defending fluid is less wetting, the invading fluid is more wetting. Now the opposite, now the solid wants as much contact as it can possibly get with the defending fluid. So the angle is now much larger. Here it's about 90, I think, or 100. And now you see that just by geometry, just by the fact that these are kind of bulging out more because they want to keep the contact with the defending fluid, they can inter intersect each other and destabilize each other in a totally different mechanism. Okay, so this is something local. Okay, so this is what we call burst in drainage. So we have a very local jump that really only depends on, on the capillary pressure and the aperture here. Oh, I forgot that I have this one. As opposed to what I call overlap, which is a non-local cooperative event, cooperative in the sense that one meniscus can destabilize another, 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 you can have a chain of those. And this is again, kind of a peculiar physics, but who cares? No, we want to look at something at the scale of, of the field. But again, this makes the whole difference in terms of the macroscopic patterns, as I will show now. So what I did is I input that into a poor scale model, a poor scale simulator, really looking, solving for the pressure at every pore, looking at the curvature, looking at the geometry. Again, this is a something that was very challenging computationally for many, many years. And we used micro models to validate that. So we can, again, look at one-to-one -one the same geometry for these simple kind of pillars between two substrates or, or two layers. And this is the microfluidics for the, exp for the validation. So you see a very interesting, very wide range of patterns. I would not get into the details. We looked at the effect of the rate, effect of the contact angle. But the main thing is that what we see, and this is for very slow displacement. So when you have drainage, so you inject the non-wetting fluid, you get capillary fingering, as you would expect. When now still at the same high kind of viscosity ratio, still pushing this very heavy oil or uh, much, much more viscous than what you are pushing in, you get this very compact front, very little trapping as opposed to here much less interfacial area, so very, very different behavior just by virtue of changing the wettability. Okay, so we capture that in our model, and then when you increase the rates, you have a little bit more effect of viscosity, again, without getting to much of the details, but you still have this more kind of stable, more compact front, kind of reproducing the same behavior that I saw in these experiments from the 80s. And this, again, have very significant consequences, for example, in terms of the sweep efficiency, if you inject very slowly, this is the capillary number, uh, dimensionless number that here it just tells you the rate, this is the saturation, so if you inject very slowly and your medium is hydrophobic or you're injecting a fluid which is more wetting to the medium, you are in, in imbibition, you can get almost all of your oil or contaminant out, whereas if you inject very slowly and you have drainage, you get almost half of that, and of course, if you increase the rate, if you want to get rid of your contaminant very fast or get the oil very fast, you'll be left with about 20% because you have these very thin fingers. So that have implications. Again, who cares about the post-scale uh, post mechanisms, but it really have implications for what happens at the larger sample scale. So without going into too much details, yeah, you want to have lunch at some stage, but it's more than just reproducing the, or explaining quantita qualitatively the, just the behavior. Now we have also a handle, experimental and theoretical, for really developing a theory. Okay, so without getting into much details, we know what is the driving mechanism between, for example, uh, behind the viscous fingering, so screening, we know what are the important parameters, behind this capillary fingering, 
and this new mechanism of cooperative events or these uh, overlaps that leads to this compact growth. So we know that. We also have statistics of these events. And we see again that when you have this compact displacement at slow rates and high contact angle, you get dominance. So we can count that and look at that experimentally and theoretically, numerically. So we have the statistics of what type of four-scale event led to overall these different patterns at the end of the experiment. And now we can do, again, without going to any details, but we can do some scaling analysis with all this data and really get a predictive theory that you can give me what is the contact angle, what is the rate, what is the post size distribution, and I can tell you now, okay, you can expect that at this rate you'll get something more compact or something more like compact, uh, capillary fingering with trapping, or maybe if you go beyond some rate, now you are in this regime of fingering, which is maybe good for carbon sequestration because a lot of interfaces, but very bad for removing the, the contaminant and so forth. Okay, and this also allows us now to explore, as I said before, these micro, micro models and these post scale simulations allow you also to explore the effect of microstructural heterogeneity, which is very important. So again, I'll skim through all of those, just show you nice pictures. Uh, but and just tell you what did we look at. So here we looked at, for example, the effect of disorder. So this is very ordered, way, very uniform medium, intermediate and high. We can play now with both the rates and the contact angle in each of those. And we can see the effect of disorder itself, which is different at different wettabilities with the angle and different rates. Okay, so as I said before, we have a very rich parameter space. We have to look at many properties. But again, these have very important implications because if you have more homogeneous system, then you have less trapping and more compact fronts, less interfacial areas, more sweep efficiency. So again, this is more for, we cannot engineer in, in, in nature, no, but in, in engineering and manufacturing we can. We can look at spatial correlations. For example, if you have patches of large pores and small pores, this is the pore size distribution. This is from, again, these microfluidic experiments. So you can see that this will affect very strongly the type of patterns, essentially forcing all the displacement in these larger patches, kind of mimicking the geometry. Again, this is more relevant for geological medium when you have, again, some spatial correlations between the pore sizes. We also looked at the effect of spatial correlation. So these patches of small and large pores, how these affect drying. And this has a very significant effect of drying because when you have this more patchy kind of medium, which leads to more patchy invasion or more patchy uh, structures, this actually keeps, this is air invading. This is the microfluidic experiment I showed before where A, I'm drying and I inv air invades into the medium here. So the water, this is air, this is water in white. The water is still connected as in liquid form. So you don't have to go, unlike here, diffusing through this dry zone already. And this keeps the drying rate much faster. So you get much, much faster drying rates as you increase correlation. Okay, one more example, again, that I just skimmed through is what I sh started uh, showing before, is this capillary fracturing, this induced, capillary induced deformations to the matrix in a, again, a deformable porous medium, like a sediment, like sand. And again, what I showed before is that you have these very slight deformations of the particles, which can really affect the patterns because they affect the connectivity Again, very important in two-phase flow. And we did this experiment, we did some simulations. Again, very different behavior just by virtue of allowing these deformations. Now, these deformations can be introduced or happen when you decrease the confinement. So as you go, for example, higher up in the sediment, we have less confining stress. When you reduce the particle size, because then the capillary pressure becomes much, much stronger also the particle stiffness. So you can play around or you can look at different regimes if you wish. And this is where this kind of phase diagrams become handy because we can really look at, vari at all the magnitude different properties. And there's many, many parameters that affect this. This is why we use this phase diagram. And also the rates affect here. 
But again, without going into much of the details, we can really we can really now use this very simple experimental and numerical systems to come up with a theory. So once again, we came up with a scaling analysis with the dimensionless numbers, dimensionless number, or a pair of them here, that again, I'm, I can take the properties of the medium, so post-size distribution, the stiffness, so is it quartz, is it clays, uh, what is the confinement, so are you one meter deep or a kilometer deep, and I can really predict, again, it's a first order approximation, but I can really predict, are you in this regime when you get this fracture or when you get these vents opening up, or are you in this regime when you, the formations are very small, are negligible, and then they are always small, even here, but the effect is negligible, and then will you get this type of fingering, that type of fingering, and so forth. So again, this simplicity of the system allows us to develop the theory to predict it. And this is a very interesting kind of field of research, which I'm also pursuing, this flow in the form of a porous medium, because it has very far-reaching implications. Again, the, the fact that you have this preferential pathway, these chimneys of, of fractures or, or fingers, this forming by deformation, means that you can have orders of magnitude faster flow, and if it's a hot fluid, you know, if it's geothermal, it's also energy, then you would assume that everything, if you would assume that everything is uniform. Okay, so you really have to take into account and use this very simplified kind of theory just to get a feeling of are you off by three, four, five orders of magnitude. So the, there's many implications to many systems. For example, we are studying pockmark formation. This is, this is like, a, again, a hilly cell, a 2D cell with some coarse sediment and fine sediment, and we're looking at the formation of pockmarks. Uh, Hydrate-bearing sediments, this is very important. It allows this venting to the atmosphere, both by these chimneys, but also there's recent evidence of these uh, hydrate pipes. I don't know if you're familiar, are you familiar with hydrates? Or no. So this is like an ice-like ice uh, substance that is formed from, in nature, mostly methane, but other gases and water under high pressures and low temperatures, which are, you know, uh, Sorry? Yeah, so, so permafrost, but also in all the, the continental shelves, there's a wide region where hydrates form and they are stable. And this means that in some cases you form these vents, then the water reacts with the gas because the temperature and, and pressure are such that the conditions allow it to form this hydrate shell. And now you have a solid shell that protects the methane from oxidizing, oxidizing from diffusing to the sediment, from interacting with the water. And this can have essentially a pipe that sends all the methane to the atmosphere. So very important, uh, uh, again, environmental aspect. We also looked at overpressures. So when hydrate dissociates, there's a huge amount of gas stored in these solid structures. So very high overpressures. A lot of the submarine landslides are because of that. And tsunamis, so we looked at, again, th these kind of capillary fractures can actually remove or alleviate the, the, the pressures, the overpressures. We also looked at drying. Again, when you have drying, when you have the air invading into your soil, these preferential pathways can, uh, or these deformations, these capillary deformations can allow very preferential pathways, which feeds back again, for example, for the drying rate, so the, the rate that this soil will dry if you allow it to dry this way and this way, just by changing, for example, the pore size distribution is very uh, significant. And this is not just for soil, this is interesting for curing of cements or food or paints or a lot of industrial applications. Okay, I think it's a good place to stop. There's many, many more, again, examples and, and, and a lot of physical, phys physically interesting problems, but I think this is enough for a flavor. So just to summarize, there's various pore scale mechanisms, hydrodynamic, uh, mechanical, chemical, that lead to this non-equilibrium that then affects things at much larger scales in the terms of rate dependency, path dependency or hysteresis, instabilities, and these preferential pathways, which I think is very, very important. And I, th I know that a lot of geoscientists are now into that because, again, we cannot just assume uniformity or or use the continuum model at any scale, as if nothing is, uh, as if everything is uniform. 
And hopefully I convince you that there's very important consequence for various systems where you inject or there's naturally fluid flow or fluid displacement. So engineering applications like CO2 sequestration or storage of hazardous waste or nuclear waste, energy storage, uh, enhanced recovery, remediation. Because this really, this processes really affect the storage capacity and the rate that you can inject and store, for example, CO2. It affects the risk of leakage and trapping. For example, if you have these capillary fractures, then you're really, you don't want to put there a nuclear repository no, or, or CO2. This interplay with mechanics is very important for induced seismicity, which is a big, of course, concern in, in all of these applications, or, or CO2 sequestration and, uh, and uh, geothermal. Obviously, it affects significantly the sweep efficiency. If you want to remove some oil or, or, or uh, another contaminant, it affects the reaction rates through the facial area if it's too fluid or, or just in the solution. So really, all that is really something that I think we have to take into account when we are doing you know, our global assessments. So again, not modeling at the post scale everything because that's impossible and that's a lifetime of work, but just taking into account, okay, will I have this type of phenomena? Then I have to, in my estimates, I have to take this scenario into effect. Thank you very much.